called me up and he asked me if I would accept a commission to write a play. So that one was easy. Yeah, I'll, I'll write a play for you. And the reason he was calling me was that uh, the year before, I had been invited to, back to Harvard University, and uh, I was supposed to give a talk about uh, the role of art in medical practice. And uh, this conference organizer had put together this big meeting where artists and doctors were coming together to talk about art and medicine. Sounds kind of cool, and it actually was kind of cool. Um, so when I went to the conference, uh, I told the organizer, I was on after lunch, I said, when I come on, just say, uh, the next speaker is uh, Bill Thomas. And that's really weird at Harvard, because people are pretty uptight about their uh, titles there, if you could imagine. Uh, anyway, so I got up there, and I sat down and said uh, to the audience, I am an artist. And for the next hour, I just talked about my approach to art and why I thought art was important and what I thought art had to do with medicine and healing. And people were like, yeah, mm, that's good, great. And then the last sentence of my speech before I left the stage was, I am an artist and I'm also a graduate of Harvard Medical School and a physician and a geriatrician. And the whole room went, <gasps> Because I want you to imagine, okay, we're at Harvard, I have my hoodie on and my jeans, and I sit up there and tell them I'm an artist, and they're like, okay, this nice, funky artist is going to tell us about art, isn't that nice? And then they found out that I was a physician. Well, this guy who gave me the commission was in the audience that day, and he said that's exactly what doctors need, is to think about these things from both points of view. So I set to work uh, writing a play, uh, and how I started the play was I had the image in my mind of a young man playing the trumpet. That's it. That's all I had. And I had to figure out what was supposed to happen to the young man with the trumpet. I didn't know. I didn't even know his name. And uh, before, before I really was busy uh, writing novels and plays and stuff, I always heard people say to me uh, about writers saying, well, the, the, the characters tell me what's going to happen and all that. I always thought that was baloney. It turns out it's really true. I had to listen to this young man and find out what happened to him. And it turns out I was hearing him play the trumpet in 1972. I didn't realize that. And it turned out that when I heard him play the trumpet, that was the last time he ever played the trumpet. And it turned out he was pre-med, and he'd just gotten into medical school. And he'd put down his trumpet and turned all of his attention to medicine. And he went on to have a brilliant career, and he rose to the top of his profession and he was the chief of medicine. And then one day, a young woman who was going to start her internship came to see him. And he lectured her about being responsible and not letting your private life interfere with your medical career. And blah, blah, blah. I could translate it this way. <laughs> That's basic. I wrote it in words, but that was it. And we've all heard this. So he didn't realize it, but standing in the room with them while he was giving her this lecture was Asclepios, the god of medicine. Who could have guessed? And Asclepios, after the professor leaves, Asclepios took this young woman aside and said, you know, I think you, I, you're going to have some hard times here. I think I'll be your mentor. 
And what happens is Asclepios, the god of medicine, tells her the story of his life. Anybody know the story of Asclepios' life? Okay. His mother was pursued by Apollo. And she was human. And you know, I'm saying pursued by Apollo. Everybody gets it, right? The Greek gods just didn't go on dates, okay? Let's put it that way. Uh, anyway, so she became pregnant, but she did not love Apollo. She loved a mortal man. So she snuck off and married the mortal man. Now, it's kind of hard to hide things from the sun god, you know? It's just sort of hard to keep things out of sight from him. So he found out, and he came back and killed his lover. But, the, um, uh, but at the last minute, he took mercy on the baby, and he cut open the womb and took the baby out of the womb. Now, if you want to talk about a single dad, Apollo is not your guy, okay? No. So he dropped the baby off with a centaur, who was half man, half horse, named Chiron. And Chiron raised the baby. It was this baby Asclepios. And uh, he taught Asclepios how to heal, because centaurs are good at healing, and Chiron was the best. So by the time Asclepios was a man, he was the greatest physician on earth. And as he got older, he got so good, he could save everyone. Think about that for a minute. Well, what happened is Hades, the god of the underworld, started getting a little upset. Hello? Where's my people? Because Asclepios was running around saving everybody's life. No people, nobody was dying. So Hades complained to Zeus, and Zeus had enough of this, so he threw a thunderbolt at Asclepios and killed him. Once Asclepios was dead, whew, off to the underworld. Now the story might have ended there, could easily have ended there, but the humans were so mad at Zeus for killing Asclepios, they stopped worshiping all the gods. Totally stopped. And that made all the gods mad. And so finally, Zeus went down to the underworld, got Asclepios, brought him out of the underworld, and made him into a god. And Asclepios, who had been a man, became the god of medicine. So Asclepios helps this young woman as she struggles to figure out how to be an intern. And the chief of medicine has a heart attack. Because, I mean, what's a play without a heart attack? I mean, I think all plays have heart attacks. So, and it, by the end of the play, Asclepios grants this young woman one favor. Now, try to imagine this. You're a young physician. The god of medicine, is, of medicine is standing in front of you, and he's going to give you one favor. What would you ask for? She asked Asclepios to save the chief's life. Here's why. Remember that trumpet? Remember how he put it down? The chief of medicine had lost his way. He'd lost his true purpose in life. And she could see that if he was given another chance and if he, if he could play music again, he would mm, return and be healthy and strong. And she was right. Now, here's the thing. The name of the play is Play What's Not There. 
There's a famous quote from a jazz musician named Miles Davis. And uh, an interviewer asked Miles Davis, Miles, how do you know what to play? And Miles said, you don't play what's there, you play what's not there. When you built the greenhouses across the street, you decided to play what's not there. You don't play what's there, you play what's not there. That's art, that's beauty and love. So, uh, in a little while, I'm going to go back home. And you're going to be here, the elders, and the soon-to-be elders. And you're going to start on a journey of discovery. And as I wrap up, I wanted to leave you with uh, one thought the best understanding or definition I have ever found of the greenhouse is that a greenhouse is a vessel that sails through time. We've all seen vessels that sail across the water or sail through the air. The greenhouse sails through time. It takes us through time. And the house stays right where it is, across the road. But the people in it are on a journey. The Shabazim, the people who work in the house, they're sailors. And every day they sail through time with the elders. The Shabazim who work in the house, they're midwives, helping elders have the best elderhood possible. The Shabazim who work in the houses across the street are men and women sons and daughters, husbands and wives, brothers and sisters. They're human beings. And they will make mistakes. And the people who lead them will make mistakes. When I picked up the guitar, the first thing I did was start making mistakes. As long as I play it, and as long as I sing, I'll make mistakes. What matters is that you stay true to yourselves, true to your heart, true to the spirit that led you to build those buildings in the first place. Don't forget that. Don't forget. Thank you. Dr. Collins, thank you for your inspiration. Thank you. Thanks thank for you having me. Thank you for your vision. And uh, blessings to you as you travel back home. Thank you. Continue to share your, your vision of, of what elderhood is about. Again, his books are for sale out here, as well as Joanne's. I invite you to, to take one home and, and read another story of Dr. Thomas's. Thank you again. <laughs>